Hello, VR class. I hope you're all doing well, staying happy, healthy, and safe. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about augmented reality and mixed reality. Depending on who you talk to, uh, some people say that AR and MR are the same thing. Other people say that they're, they're slightly different than each other, whilst other people still say that, that one of these is a subset of the other, and which one's the subset of what, nobody really knows for sure. Again, uh, and, and, and it, it depends on who you ask. But for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to sort of use these terms interchangeably. And uh, so you're probably somewhat familiar with these concepts already. Like if, you, if you're into like any of the, the, the superhero kind of movies, uh, you've seen like the super genius guy go out and figure out something in his secret lab or <laughs> in the case of this guy, his, his not so secret lab. Nothing's really secret with this dude. Uh, but, but what happens is uh, they put these holograms out in the world around them. Uh, they can build things in 3D. They can look at data in 3D. They can they can monitor real-time situations all across the planet using information that's seemingly hovering in the world around them. So this is this is an example of augmented reality, sort of an idealized, perfect version of augmented reality, where we do have these things that look like holograms sitting out in the world around us. Uh, so this is this is you know the the the, the perfect concept of what augmented reality could be. Now, the idea of this actually isn't, isn't terribly new. Uh, you know, we've talked earlier in the semester about Ivan Sutherland and uh, his first VR display. Well, actually, it's not a VR display. His display that he built back in 1968, might have even been 67. So in, in that 1967-1968 that area, uh, actually let you see the virtual imagery superimposed on the real world. That's an augmented reality display. And if you look at his picture here, you can see, you know, that, that you can see his eyes through the, the, the display. And that's because in front of his eyes are little half-silvered mirrors or optical combiners that project the virtual light from the monitors on the side of his head into his eyes. So he could see through them into the real world. And here's some photographs taken through his display. This map of the United States, from his point of view, is hovering out there midair in front of him. And since it was motion tracked, you could walk around it, you could look at it from the back, you could look at it from the sides. And all this was happening in, in real time. So the concept of augmented reality isn't terribly new. Uh, and, uh, you know, he even had... Uh, nifty ways of interacting with it. Uh, so, so really like mixing reality up here. Uh, the geometry that he was manipulating was, was virtual in 3D, but he actually had boards with words written on them that was his physical menus. So you could walk up and, and tap one of these things, one of these options on his, his physical menu board. And then that let you do new things inside of that virtual world. Now, if we think about augmented reality uh, in, in strict visual terms, that you're putting light out into the world that lets you see things and, and do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do, I venture to say that, that augmenting reality has been around far, far longer than even this. That it's not so much a new concept that it's potentially not even a modern concept. Now, if we go back to, you know, the first time that we lit a torch so that we could see in the dark, that's taking light, artificially generated by some process that you, the human, the user, did, and illuminating the darkness. That's kind of cool. So, you know, in its very, very primitive, most rudimentary form, augmented reality is adding light information that wouldn't normally be available to a person's view. Now, we've come a long way. So even even green screening, uh, so, uh, technically this is this is a process referred to as like chroma key. Uh, so 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 green screening or blue screening or, or whatever uh, is, is a form of augmented reality. So we're taking a view of a real world situation and we're replacing certain real world elements. In this case, the green screen and putting information displays into it that wouldn't normally be available. Now we're seeing this pop up all over the place. So if, if you think about, uh, you know, watch, watching sports, like, like a football game or something, uh, nowadays uh, we, have, we have information superimposed on the football field. Now if you look at this, a football field is pretty much a gargantuan green screen. So this really helps us, you know, 
uh, add these visual elements. We, we can edit them in and have the players run over them. And from the player's point of view, they're not actually there. But for you, the viewer at home, you're getting additional information that tells you things about the game and what's going on that you wouldn't normally have visual access to. Now, a kind of more, more active uh, mixing of uh, visual information uh, are, are head-up displays. Head-up displays are actually, in a way, kind of similar to uh, that, that uh, Sutherland display from, from the late 60s, uh, in that you can see through it, and visual information is augmented on top of that. So this is all happening in real time. You know, aircraft have had this for, for a pretty, pretty long time. You even see it in some cars nowadays where you have head up displays that tell you your speed or your GPS directions or whatever as you're driving down the road. But this is in itself a form of augmented reality display. It's adding visual information to the pilot's view of the world that uh, he or she wouldn't normally have. And like I said, you know, we're seeing the, these same kind of things uh, popping up in, in, in cars these days as well. Now, this is, this is interesting, because uh, what we've talked about so far haven't, hasn't really been something that you'd wear on your head like you would a VR headset. Uh, but uh, the displays like, uh, like Sutherland had, which, which was head warden but sort of room constricted, uh, and those head-up displays like you see in an aircraft, you see, you literally see through them. This is a particular class of augmented reality that's referred to as optical see-through augmented reality, sometimes called OSTAR. And uh, how it works is, is pretty, pretty simplistic. Uh, it's it's kind of cool and, and is very similar to that Sutherland display that we saw before. So you're wearing a VR-ish headset, so something that sits on top of your head. And you have what's called an optical combiner, something that's reflective, but also lets some light from the surroundings pass through it, like a half-silvered mirror or those what they call two-way mirrors that you uh, that you see in like, like uh, uh, security booths in uh, in uh, in department stores and such. Uh, so you have a display that draws virtual imagery stored up here above or to the side of the optical combiner, and its light is being projected down onto the optical combiner. While geometry that's out here in the real world, you know, real, actual stuff, uh, you can see through it like a sort of a heavy pair of glasses. And then on this side of the combiner, light from the real world and light from the virtual world get overlaid on each other. So they look like they're in the same visual space. Now, uh, this is an example of what, what used to be a really, really popular optical see-through AR display. A lot of the early augmented reality research took place using displays very similar to this. This is the Sony Glastron. And using this, uh, allowing you to add virtual elements to the real world, like I said, lets you see things and get information that you wouldn't normally get. This is a, a screenshot of a, a test application from, I believe, the um, Naval Research Lab in, in, in DC. And what, what they're doing is they're in a parking lot looking out at a bunch of buildings but they can actually see details of the building. They can actually see windows that are on the other side of buildings and buildings behind buildings, sort of Superman X-ray vision style. And that's one of the powers of augmented reality is it can let you see things that aren't normally available to your view in the real world. This is actually the, the, the first AR display I worked with too. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, actually my very first augmented environment that I got working. Uh, when I was uh, a wee grad student long ago. And you can see how uh, it adds details drawn on top of the real world. So, you know, we've got the outline of our, our, our hallway, and we've got some, some th synthetic objects uh, added to the scene, and we've got our light switches and filing cabinets, and yeah, you, you can add essentially holograms to your view of the real world. Now, there are... Uh, uh, more, more sophisticated implementations of this. So that one you know, was room confined, but an early uh, AR, uh, mobile AR system uh, was called the Turing machine. For those of you who are computer scientists and, and uh, know of the Turing machine, uh, you, you, you see the obvious joke here. This was the Turing machine. It was an augmented reality display that you could take out into the world, and it used GPS antennas and computers mounted in backpacks and 
uh, uh, optical see-through display so you could walk around the world and it could monitor your position and then give you visual information about your surroundings as you walked. Well, you know, as, as time goes on, uh, things definitely get smaller and cheaper. This is this is a, an Epson, I believe it's an Epson display uh, that that essentially does all the same stuff that this guy was doing, but in a very compact device that's driven by a cell phone. Yeah, there's there's definitely an aesthetic difference at the very least between between these two setups. But that's the nature of technology. As things uh, become more advanced, we, we tend to, to get them smaller, more compact, more efficient. But we've always got to start somewhere. And this was a really, really cool start to mobile augmented reality. Now, this is uh, the augmented reality display that I did most of my, my, my PhD work with. Uh, it, it's much, much larger. But it let you do a lot of uh, a, lot, a lot of things that say some of the, the smaller displays wouldn't let you do. And in, in addition, this one could be toggled in between uh, AR mode and VR mode, so it could could, could work as both. Uh, this was uh, an Invisor ST60, so a really really large but very very flexible display and really really good lenses. The optics were just just really nice in it. I took a lot of measurements of. Uh, the lens distortion from these guys uh, back in the day, and they were they were essentially essentially uh, minimal. Now, for VR and AR research, or more specifically for AR research, uh, we sometimes build uh, stationary displays so that we could test the limits of what's possible with the display technology. Uh, this is an example of what's called a, a haploscope, a form of tabletop AR display. Uh, and you can see all the elements that are actually in a head-mounted display broken out into levels here. So we've got our, our, our display portion, the thing that actually draws the geometry that you see projected into the real world. And then we've got focusing lenses, optical combiners, and then the place the user's head goes. So in this thing, you put your head here and you look through the little optical combiners, and suddenly you can see holograms drawn in 3D in the world in front of you. Now these research grade devices, uh, obviously you're not gonna wear this into public, but not all applications require you to be mobile. For instance, if you're doing, uh, say, uh, robotic surgery or some sort of maintenance task, a highly controlled display like this might be appropriate. But even, even, even for just research purposes, uh, a lot of this technology can be made into a, a mobile device. But first you have to understand how to properly construct it, how to properly use it, how will the users uh, interpret and perceive the geometry that you're presenting. So a, a lot of labs that do research in augmented reality build devices uh, kind of like this. Um, this, is, this is actually built by a friend of mine, uh, Gurjat Singh, uh, when, when he was working on his, his PhD work. Uh, before, before his display, I, I built a little, little tiny version of this that was uh, not nearly as sophisticated as his. Uh, and you know you can kind of see the this this uh, photograph taken through through the 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 view through the um, optical combiners of this display. And you know we're projecting a model of the Earth. You know saying hey you are here. So uh, there there have been some commercial attempts at uh, augmented reality. Uh, one of the one of the probably more successful ones was this guy. This is Google Glass. Uh, you, you don't see it quite so much anymore, but uh, Google Glass was an early augmented reality display. Now, or one of the early uh, consumer grade augmented reality displays, I have to be very specific there. Uh, and you used to actually see people walking around on the street occasionally wearing one of these things. Uh, now, the problem though is that this guy, though it's called an augmented reality display, it was more like those head up displays. What you would see wasn't in the world in front of you is more sitting up to the top of your field of view so that you could glance up and get information say text messages or gps or email or websites or something like that and you can kind of see this looking at this picture you know the person's eye is below this little part right here which is the transparent display uh, there are other attempts to uh, to make uh, displays that oh yes there's something important here uh, so the social consequences of technology uh, one of the things people started observing when a lot of folks were, were using this uh, is that people would zone out of conversations, and uh, you know you you would you would click 
and select on the display by sort of nodding your head up. So when you're talking to someone with Google Glass, you know, uh, if you saw them doing this while you were talking, you knew they weren't listening anymore. Uh, so this was this was uh, a source of some social awkwardness that resulted from the technology itself. Now, uh, Microsoft has actually made some very nice uh, AR displays called the HoloLens. This is the HoloLens 1. They've got the HoloLens 2 out now. But it's an optical see-through AR display that lets you see through the display into the world around you. And it's it's completely mobile. It's, te it's tetherless and uh, it has a, has a computational device built into it, plus it has very good motion tracking. So just like with VR, we have to track the position of your view in order to draw the right stuff on the screen for the world around you. So uh, we talked earlier about the Microsoft Connect and how that sort of a motion capture device in a box. Well, there are Connect sensors built into the halo of this device. So as you're looking around the world, it's constantly taking a 3D scan of your surroundings and monitoring where you're looking. So if I wanted to make a virtual desktop and put here, and I walked away and I came back, that virtual desktop would still be situated right here because it tracked the position where I placed it and also tracked me as I walked away so that when I came back, it would still be in place. Uh, this is a really, really cool device, and uh, I'm interested to see the... Uh, HoloLens 2s. Uh, another uh, fairly common uh, AR display that we're seeing these days is uh, the Magic Leap. Uh, Magic Leap was highly secretive for a long time. Uh, the most information we had for like years about the Magic Leap were these, these cryptic uh, uh, proof of, well not proof of concepts, um, uh, cryptic uh, um, I ideas about what you could do with the technology, and then you know a single diagram from a patent application. Uh, the actual device looks like this. It's been released now, and it's an augmented reality device that does similar tracking to what you know you see with the HoloLens. But one thing that it does in addition to that is it has adjustable focus. So if you hold your hand out in front of you and you move it in, you notice that as you watch your fingers come closer, the background becomes blurry. And similarly, if you if you look at the background and sort of look at the tips of your fingers. Um, out of the corner of your eye, you'll see the background is clear, but your hand is blurry. So that has to do with the focus of your eye. And one of the things that most VR and AR displays do is they fix the focus of the display at a, at a set distance, uh, meaning you don't get those depth of field cues that you would normally get from how your eye naturally focuses. Well, in uh, the Magic Leap, they try to approximate that by having an adjustable optical pathway so that they can switch between, I think it's two, maybe three focal depths. Now granted, in the real world, we have an infinite number of depths we can focus to. But still, just having the ability to go in between several that you might be working in uh, could potentially you know, give you a, a more comfortable viewing experience and a more realistic uh, uh, visual sensation of your, your augmented world. There are also some, some nifty, uh, almost DIY augmented reality displays out here. This is Project North Star. Uh, from uh, Magic Leap. I actually think they're called Ultra Leap now. They were, they were purchased uh, by another company recently. And this is a really cool looking display. Uh, what's really cool, what's even cooler in my opinion, is some of their early pictures of, of their, their 3D printed versions of this guy. You can actually go online and get the, the 3D printable files to, to make most of this. The only thing that you probably, well, you definitely can't make at home, unless you got some really nice workshop equipment, is uh, the optical combiners. But there are companies out there who are actually printing these guys too, because they release the CAD files for them. Uh, so you can make these uh, optical, or get these optical combiners made for you, and make your own augmented reality display and look super cool uh, at home. Oh yeah, and here are some examples of, of, uh, of what, what uh, that you, you can see through an augmented reality display. These are from Project North Star, and uh, these are supposed to be videos. Let's see if they'll actually play. Oh yeah, there we go. So you can kind of see uh, how, how this looks from the user's point of view, having holograms overlaid on their view of the real world. Yeah. Yeah, this one's actually my favorite. So, so, so essentially reaching out and grabbing this virtual cube and you can run your hand through it and your real hand can occlude it. It's, it's just beautiful. 
So uh, augmented reality has a lot of potential uh, for, for, for applications involving information displays uh, and enabling you to see things, details that might not otherwise be available. For instance, imagine uh, being a physician, uh, examining a patient and being able to s essentially peer inside the patient while you're doing the examination. Uh, using data from like a previously generated CAT scan or an ultrasound or an MRI or something along those lines. Now, there's already a lot of immersive displays out there, lots of VR displays. There's probably not quite as many AR displays, but there's lots of VR displays out there already. And we can actually take advantage of those for augmented and mixed reality as well, using a technique called video see-through augmented reality. So video see-through augmented reality is in a way kind of like those uh, uh, green screen and uh, uh, football field techniques, you know, where we're getting a video of the world and then we're editing that video uh, in real time to, uh, to add additional information. So the idea here for a video see-through AR display is that you have a VR display and you mount cameras on the front that represent the view of the real world. And then in software, you combine the video from the real world with the video being generated for your virtual environment. And then they're overlaid on each other uh, in, in video space, in pixel space. And you can sort of see the example up here. You know, you've got a virtual scene, you have your camera view, and then you add them together to get that superimposed view of the real world plus your virtual elements. And you can get some pretty compelling results. This is, this is, this is a, uh, a much younger Dr. Jones uh, wearing an Oculus Rift, a development kit too, a DK2. And uh, I converted this guy into a, a video see-through display uh, using some standard web cameras. And this is actually the view that we're seeing through it. Uh, you know, we're adding a, a virtual bunny rabbit to the top of our desk. And, you know, it looks fairly compelling. Now, it, it's going to be limited by the display capabilities of the VR headset. So you're limited to VR headset frame rate, you're ended, limited to VR headset pixels, the resolution, those kind of things. Uh, but it has certain flexibilities, uh, one of which is you can sort of get uh, video-based tracking of objects for free registered to the real-world space, and that's the important part. So right here, we're doing some uh, video-based tracking with augmented reality. We have a marker printed out in the world, and we've got a virtual object attached to that marker. So if we pick this piece of paper up and tote it around, we can actually see this virtual representation of the dragon or a 3D scan of yours truly. Yeah, you get to see like the almost real version of me right there. Uh, and you can see it floating inside your hand as long as you have that marker. So it feels like it's attached to that, uh, to that device or attached to that uh, uh, piece of paper. Another version of video see-through augmented reality has come about as a re result of having uh, cell phones and tablets that have pretty sophisticated motion tracking and cameras built into them already. And uh, this is what I like to call magic window augmented reality, where you're holding up a tablet or a cell phone and using the camera to see the real world and then have virtual elements added to it on the cell phone screen itself. And so you can kind of kind of see, you know, what the person will be seeing here. They see this cylinder in the real world, and it's visible on the video, on the tablet, uh, and we can add virtual stuff like that virtual cube to the scene. Now, some of you are probably already familiar with this. Uh, there, there are lots of uh, cell phone-based games out there. Here's an example of, uh, of, you know, blue boxes are always bigger on the inside, especially if you have augmented reality. <laughs> But some of you are familiar with this already from uh, AR games available on like uh, your, your Nintendo 3DS or uh, your cell phone playing Pokemon Go. All of these are examples uh, of augmented reality applications using the sort of magic window technology uh, where you're seeing a video view of the real world on your tablet and then virtual things like, like Pokemon are being added to your scene. Now, we talked about also uh, using projective rooms, so caves, uh, for virtual environments. Well, you can do something similar with augmented reality as well. Uh, you can use projectors to project virtual elements into the world. And uh, this is a dude named uh, Henry Fuchs. He's uh, 
He's at uh, UNC, and he's done a lot of work in augmented reality, tons of work, and especially uh, in terms of like, like telepresence. So uh, interacting with a person using AR and projection that may be located somewhere else in the world as if they're there with you. Uh, this has uh, recently been uh, been been being called uh, this projected AR uh, spatial augmented reality or SAR. I actually really don't like this term because all augmented reality, whether projected or video see-through, optical see-through, are in themselves spatial augmented reality. Uh, so that, that's a, that's a an odd term to be associated with projective augmented reality or projected augmented reality. Uh, but uh, if you hear people talking about SAR or, or spatial augmented reality, this is usually what they're referring to, uh, projecting AR scenes into the world around them. There are different ways to go about that. One way is to utilize head-mounted projectors. So this is a head-mounted projector system uh, that was developed at University of Southern California in their mixed reality lab. And uh, the user is wearing a camera that's tracking their view, and they also have a tiny little Pico projector mounted on top of their head. So as their view is being tracked, visual information is being projected onto their surroundings using this projection system. And uh, what's really neat about this is if you have the room that you're going to be doing this in prepared with, say, retroreflective materials, you can have multiple people looking at the same thing, both getting separate views. And we talked a little bit about this in class, uh, but just, just, uh, just a reminder, uh, retroreflective materials are materials that reflect light back at the source it came from. So the material that street signs are made out of, you notice when you're driving down the road, when you get like uh, on axis with with the street sign, you know, it reflects a lot of the light back to you, but it doesn't until you're just kind of like the right angle. Uh, this is that same kind of material. So using head mounted projection, if you have a retroreflective material like that, you can use techniques like this to support a multi user augmented experience in uh, in a situation where, where you know, people are in the same physical space. Because if you think about it, if you got a bunch of projectors on people's heads. Under normal circumstances, those projections are going to overlap. So you want to try to prevent that. So this kind of approach helps, helps prevent overlapping projections. Uh, there's also been some, some work looking at um, uh, using the same sort of head-mounted projection technique uh, for, for games and, and, uh, and uh, other kind of applications. Uh, this was a Kickstarter several years ago. I'm not sure... I'm not sure where this ended up going, but it was a really nifty idea that used the same kind of technology or a similar kind of technology uh, to that of the, the head brown under projectors we were just uh, talking about. So AR has its own problems, though. AR is hard to get right anyway. It's really hard. Uh, so in VR, uh, if the world isn't quite right, you don't have a reference to tell you otherwise. Uh, if the world isn't moving quite right, or there's a little bit of drift in your tracking, it's going to affect the whole virtual environment. But in augmented reality, you see the real world. You see the ground truth. So if your tracking isn't right, or your geometry isn't being projected properly, you notice this much, much more easily. Uh, it sticks out. So that's one of the disadvantages uh, to AR that makes it a little bit difficult to work with. And each one of these guys, uh, video see-through and augmented, uh, video see-through and optical see-through have their own challenges. Video see-through, it's easy to implement because it's essentially just a VR display with some cameras on the front. And virtual objects appear solid because uh, one of the, the disadvantages of using optical see-through is you can't reflect black. You can't reflect the absence of color. So the darker an object is in optical see-through AR, the more transparent it becomes. Uh, but in video see-through, since you're actually, you know, looking at illuminated or unilluminated pixels, dark objects that are virtual still appear dark and solid. They don't become transparent. Now you're limited by the characteristics uh, of the camera, the display, in terms of like the resolution, field of view, and how quickly it updates the frame rate. Optical see-through, on the other hand, is a little more difficult to implement because you have to worry about additional optical elements, getting those optical combiners in the right place, uh, getting, getting them lined up with your view of the world, and virtual objects appear to be semi-transparent. This is that, uh, that uh, problem we're talking about where you can't draw black light 
You can't reflect blackness. So the darker an object is, the more transparent it becomes. This is an excellent video. Uh, I'm going to link this in the description. Uh, and it's, I think it's actually from, from Henry Fuchs' group. Uh, that very clearly illustrates uh, uh, the transparency of darker objects uh, in, in optical see-through AR. And one potential disadvantage, or potential advantage, depending on how you want to look at it, is the real world is always visible at its natural resolution, at the resolution you would normally see reality. And reality has a big field of view. It's, it's your natural field of view. Uh, this is good in that we got, get a lot of information about our movements and what we're doing based on you know, uh, our, our periphery and having this wide field of view. A disadvantage, however, is the virtual elements typically don't match your real field of view. Your virtual stuff usually fits in a smaller window, which can sometimes break the illusion of it being present with you in the real world. Uh, another disadvantage is that the real world doesn't lag. You experience the real world in real time. If you move, the real world doesn't drag behind you. But because tracking takes time, and it takes time to draw pixels on your screen, the virtual world will always lag behind you at least a little bit. So there's always going to be this, this disjoint movement between the virtual world and the real world. So that's also another disadvantage of, uh, of using optical see-through. You get the, a, a larger um, disparity between the virtual elements you see and the real elements you see. Uh, we also talked about uh, um, virtual objects being transparent, but sometimes uh, you, you, you want, you want uh, the real world to, to occlude these virtual objects. And uh, occlusion is actually a problem because in order for you to occlude the virtual world, uh, you have to know where objects in the physical world are, which you know requires you to know the real world in 3D. And uh, that's hard to do unless you have something scanning the world around you or you've got the geometry already plugged in. So the, the, the X-ray vision problem is kind of summarized like this. Uh, unless you know something about uh, the physical world, uh, your virtual stuff will almost always be drawn on top of the physical elements. Unless you use something like a depth scanner like you might have in the Kinect or something else uh, to figure out where the real world objects are relative to the depth of the virtual objects. Uh, another example of the uh, X-ray vision problem is literal X-ray vision, sort of. So how do we perceive objects that are located behind other surfaces? So we're not used to seeing humans and like other humans and like other devices and walls and things in, in sort of fishbowl vision where we can see through that surface. And this can affect how we perceive the depth of objects located behind surfaces. And this is in particular a really interesting issue for medical applications where you're gonna be peering inside of patients. And it's also very important to register the content of your virtual world with the physical world when this is the case. Uh, because it's uh, for, for applications like medicine where you're trying to look at something that's below the skin that might not otherwise be visible, you wanna make sure that you're looking at and examining the correct areas. So that virtual world is registered properly to the real world. Okay, so uh, we're gonna wrap up our lecture right about here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know. Don't forget about your final projects. Uh, those are due at the end of your usually scheduled final exam period. I've got that posted on Blackboard, so check that out. Uh, again, you're gonna be using Mozilla Hubs and, uh, and SketchUp to build uh, a virtual architectural environment and then add, uh, add elements to that. So, uh, so if you haven't started on that, go ahead and do that. It, it's, it's a fun project. I did it myself. It's great. Uh, I think you'll get a lot of uh, interesting experience from it. And uh, otherwise, it's been a great semester with y'all. Uh, I, really, I really miss seeing you in person, but uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed our, our virtual interactions and I have absolutely loved the assignments you've submitted since the break. Uh, there's there's very little that's more exciting for me than getting your assignments and getting that link to click on to open them up in, in hubs and not knowing what you're going to see and suddenly being transported into this virtual world that you guys have constructed. It has been one of the most fun experiences of my life. I absolutely love it. Uh, 
and again, I hate not seeing you guys in person, and I, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, fortunately, I've heard back from most of you guys. A couple of you I haven't. Uh, I've, sent, I've sent emails to some of you saying, hey, how you doing? Haven't heard from you. Uh, if, uh, if you got one of those emails and didn't reply to me, oh my gosh, please reply. I want to hear from you. Uh, so again, uh, I hope you guys are doing great, staying happy, healthy, and safe, washing your hands, and uh, I'll see you in cyberspace.